Tasha Carter is an internationally sought after speaker, trainer, and sales expert. She is known as an industry legend and one of the most famous and influential direct selling leaders in America. Tasha has built sales organizations totaling over 100,000 distributors, expanding into several countries. She was also ranked in the top 15 female networkers in the world out of over 14 million women. She's very engaging. She's so real and tells it like it is. She, you know it's coming from her heart, her experience. I think she's great. She's very energetic. She's very passionate about what she's teaching. Pasha Carter has conducted thousands of live events around the world with audiences as large as 20,000 people. She has trained more than a million people on how to become leaders, team builders, and top producing salespeople. Very powerful and heartfelt speech. Very relatable. Very likable. Very engaging. She's very good. She's very energetic and she's very interactive. She really drove home that anyone can succeed and she showed me how. I think that she's amazing. Absolutely a ton. She was, she was wonderful. Furthermore, she has shared the stage with virtually every major speaker in the personal development and business training spaces. I'm talking about thought leaders like Anthony Robbins, Mark Victor Hansen, Les Brown, Robert Kiyosaki, and Eric Thomas, to name a few. Pasha's mission is to help people break through the bondage and excuses that stop them from reaching true freedom emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. So if you are ready to launch to your next level, please join me in welcoming Pasha Carter. Good, well first of all, let me start by saying that it's an absolute honor to be here. I'm excited because I get to talk to all of you about my favorite topic. Now, this is how I started, I was 23 years old. And anybody ever had that person where they kept calling you and calling you and inviting you out to these personal growth things or inviting you out to these meetings and you kept ignoring them? Anybody ever been there or was it just me? Oh, wow, everybody, huh? So listen, what happened to me at 23 years old, a family member continued to call me and say, hey, you got to come out and take a look at something. You got to come out and take a look at something. And it was because at 23 years old, he knew that I was in a funk in my life. Anybody ever just been in a funk where you just were at the point where you weren't happy doing what you're doing? And that was me at 23, and let me tell you why. Both of my parents were educators. My dad was an educator for 30 years. My mom was an educator for 29 years. So guess what I was taught? I was taught if you wanna be successful, all you have to do is go out and get a good education because then that education is going to get you a good job but not just a good job a good job with good benefit, benefit. oh wow you guys were told the same story huh yep. how many of you figured out that plan doesn't quite work <laughs> because here I was at 23 I did all of that you know I went to school I was always on the honors roll because it was a requirement in my household if you want to have any life you got to be on the honors roll and then I went off to college and in college I found myself just kind of trying to figure out why I'm here. And to make a long story short, I ended up leaving Alabama at the time. I went to University of Alabama, Roll Tide. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, really in search of a better way. And when I got there, I was at the point where I was working not just one job, but I was working two jobs. So I was working at Emory University during the day, and in the evenings I was a gymnastics instructor and an NFL cheerleader. So I had a lot of stuff that I was doing. But here's what happened. I found myself at a point where even with two jobs, I was sleeping on the floor of my best friend's one-bedroom apartment because I couldn't make ends meet. And so when I say I was in a funk, I was at the point in my life where I said, how did I get here? Like, I thought I'd done all the right things. Like, how did I end up here? And so when I was invited out to that presentation, I was like the worst person you'd ever want to invite out because I was negative. Anybody ever had somebody that needs to be positive and open, but they're negative and skeptical and broke? Anybody ever had that friend? Well, that was me. And I went out to that presentation, and I was the person I had my arms folded. I had a wall up this high, and I was just like, okay, you know, just whatever. Give it to me. And let me tell you, the guy in front of the room, 
was one of the nicest guys I'd ever met in my life. He was 26 years old at the time, and he was making more money in one month than I was making all year long working for a living. So let me ask you a question. Do you think I needed to listen to him? You better believe it. But let me tell you what I love more was he was positive. He was happy. He was smiling. I said, I want some of that. Like, what is that? So I sat in that presentation, and he started talking to me about becoming an, well, he was talking to everybody, but in my mind, he was just talking to me. And he started talking about entrepreneurship. He started talking about changing your mindset. He started teaching all of the things that I'd, re I'd heard about, but I didn't really understand. And to make a long story short, at the end of that presentation, I walked up to that gentleman. I said, listen, I said, I'm committed, and I will be one of the hardest workers you'll ever meet if you're just willing to teach me what you know. And he said, all you have to do is show up. So every time he'd do a presentation, every time he'd do a training, I was sitting right here where this gentleman right here with the blue shirt sitting. I was always on the front row. I was always right there. I was always leaning forward, and I was always learning. By 25, I started having some success. By 29, I was making six figures from home. And in my 30s, my husband and I were blessed to earn over a million dollars from the comfort of home. Now, why do I share that with you? Because I want to talk to you about the journey that many people have gone through and what it really takes in order to become successful. So let's talk about your mind, your money, your millions. Now, here's a staggering fact that's very interesting. Do you realize that America produces a new millionaire every what? Every three minutes. Is that insane or is that insane? But let me ask you a question. When you hear that, does it make you feel like it's possible? So here's my question for you. If you have not had your three minutes yet, how many of you are looking forward to your three minutes coming? Absolutely. So now, here's, let me tell you a few stories because I love talking about people who've done it. Because a lot of times we see successful people. We see these millionaires. We see these billionaires. And you know what? Many times we think that somebody just gave them a business or they woke up one day successful. And you know what? That's not how it goes. So let's take a look at some of these people. Who is this? Bob Johnson. Anybody ever heard of Bob Johnson? He was the first African-American billionaire. He grew up what? Did he grow up rich? No, he grew up what? Poor. How many, a family of what? Do you think that was a busy household? Do you think he got all the attention that he needed? Probably not. It was 10, it was 10 of them. His mother was a teacher and, so, and his father was a farmer, but he was America's first African-American billionaire. Now, let's go down here. Who is Howard Schultz? Everybody knows this guy, right? Anybody like Starbucks coffee? Yes, okay, good, I do too. I anybody have a specialty drink like me? Mine is a grande and a venti cup toffee nut latte, half soy, half non-fat, extra hot with whipped cream and caramel drizzle, just in case you're wondering. So, <laughs> but I love this guy because here's the thing. He grew up where? Brooklyn. Did he grow up in the fancy side of Brooklyn? No, he grew up where? But he had a what? He had a dream. So it didn't matter that he grew up in the projects. Who is this guy? You take a look at, anybody ever heard of Cirque du Soleil? Anybody ever seen that amazing show? Do you realize that this guy was a street performer? Can you believe that? But now we go to Vegas and we dress up in our fanciest clothing to go out and see this amazing show because he had a dream. And he wasn't willing to let the fact that he was sleeping on the streets and performing on the streets to stop him from dreaming big. Anybody ever heard of John Paul Mitchell? The products, anybody ever used those products? Well, how many of you realize that he was sleeping in his car? Living in his car before he got that business off the ground. Now, why do I share all of these stories with you? Because the one thing I want to leave everybody with here today is I need you to understand it's possible. It's not about where you're from. It's not about who you are. It's about what you got in here and what you do every single day when you wake up. So now I want to tell you a story about a personal what I call a mentor from afar, because I've watched this young lady from the moment she hit the airwaves. And when you take a look at someone who has expressed their life and opened up their life to all of us, she grew up in the inner city ghetto of where? Mississippi. She had a lot of discrimination that took place. She was neglected by her parents. She was not even raised by her parents. But she always talks about how she became free. And it was through what? Anybody know what that is? Books. She said she would sit down and she would just read these books and it would take her 
to a whole nother world. It would show her the possibilities. Even though she was living in the ghetto, these books would allow her mind to take her somewhere bigger than her current circumstances. And she went on to become not only Oprah Winfrey, when you're known by your first name, that's when you know you're big. When you can just say your first name and everybody knows you. But when you become known by a letter, and all you have to do is say O, oh, and everybody knows who you are, that's when you know you've gone to another level. Am I right? So she has blazed a trail. But one thing that I learned from her is that leaders do what? Learn. Let me ask you all a question. What's the latest books that you're reading? If I were to get in your car right now and turn it on, you were to turn it on, what's the first thing that comes on? Is it the radio? Are you listening to people who've already become millionaires? Or are you listening to something that's going to teach you how to grow your business and add an additional million or an additional six figures to whatever you're doing? See, those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. So here's an interesting story that I want to tell you. Mike Jeffrey spoke about this gentleman. Who's, who wrote the book Think and Grow Rich? Anybody familiar with this book? We all are, right? It's the top book that's ever been written when it comes to success and leadership. Now, Napoleon Hill wrote the book Think and Grow Rich. Now, here's the interesting story that a lot of people don't know, and I want to share this with you. He was in the process of writing a book when he passed, and he was writing a book called Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice, where he was interviewing some of uh, the world's top African Americans that had achieved and earned millions of dollars, but he died in the process and he wasn't able to finish the project. Well, years later, the Napoleon Hill Foundation made a phone call to a gentleman in Atlanta, Georgia, by the name of Dr. Dennis P. Kimbrough. And they said, listen, we have this manuscript. Napoleon Hill started it, but he never got a chance to finish it. Would you be willing to finish the project? Now, let me ask you a question. If you got that phone call, how many of you would be saying, absolutely, yes, just tell me what I need to do? So of course, that's what Dr. Kimbrough did. And so he went around the world, and he picked up where Napoleon Hill left off. And these were two of the very first books that I ever were at. And I will tell you that every chapter, every story in that, those two books changed my life. But here's what happened. That same gentleman, Dr. Dennis P. Kimbrough, wrote an updated version called The Wealth Choice where he interviewed today's top millionaires. He interviewed Steve Harvey. He interviewed Damon John. He interviewed Tyler Perry. And guess what? After that book was written, this is how the circle of life works. It was 20 years later, my phone rang. And it was Dr. Dennis P. Kimbrough on the other line saying, can I interview you and your husband for my new book, The Wealth Choice? Now, why do I share that with you? I went from being the person sleeping on the floor trying to figure life out to picking up a book and saying, I'm going to read, I'm going to grow. Getting up every single day when I didn't feel like getting up. Doing all the things. You know why? Because I refused to give up. And that's what I want you to get. I want you to understand that when he called on myself and my husband, it was a turning point in our life. And to be featured in that book was one of the biggest honors because what that said to me was the hard work has paid off. Does that make sense to you? How many of you have ever felt like you're just working hard and ready for it to pay off? See, your time is coming because what I want you to get is I always tell people, don't applaud the glory. Applaud the story. Because what I want you to understand is, a lot of times people see us where we are today. They see us as successful. They see us in these books. They see us speaking. But let me tell you what they didn't see. They didn't see when we were struggling trying to figure out how we could pay to come to an event. When we didn't have the money to go see Tony Robbins and we had to save up every dime that we had just to get a ticket. See, many people didn't see those times. They didn't see the times when my parents as educators were away all, single, all day, teaching everybody else, teaching everybody else, coming home so tired that they just didn't have the energy to, to go to our basketball games or go to our gymnastics meets. They just couldn't do it. See, those are the things that people don't see. If you're in sales, how many of you have ever gotten rejected over and over and over and over and over again and you just get tired? Anybody ever been there? See, a lot of times people didn't see that. They didn't see when we were going to our friends and trying to tell them about business and trying to get them as a customer, and they were all telling us no. And see, here's the challenge with most people. Everybody wants a testimony, but nobody wants to be tested. 
And see, what I want to share with you, in order to get the testimony, you've got to be willing to go through the test. And you've got to be willing to go through the test with the right attitude. And what does that take? It takes having the right mindset. Here's what I figured out. Because when I started reading all of these books and reading all these stories about all these successful people, I started asking myself, what is it, the one thing that they have in common? They were all different ages. They were different races. They were different genders. They came from different households. So what was it that made them break out of wherever they are and become these super successful people? And guess what I found out it was? It was their mindset. But you know what? The interesting thing, and it's sad because only 2% of most people in this country have that kind of mindset. And that's why 98% of the people in our country retire broke and, and, and just sad and trying to figure out what went wrong. Now, let me ask you a question. Do we have any 2%ers in the room? Are you guys all 2%ers? I'm going to assume that you are. Good. I see a lot of nods and hands here. So now take a look at the difference. The 2% of the population. Now, what do most people that are in the 98 percentile do? They want to be like who? Everybody else. Anybody ever met someone where it's more important for them to fit in than to grow? Anybody ever met someone like that? Has that ever been you? So you got to ask yourself those questions. What about surviving, just being comfortable? Anybody ever met someone where you say, what's your goal? They say, well, I just want to be comfortable. Let me, let me explain something to you. Comfort and complacency are two of the biggest downfalls of people not succeeding. Because when we get complacent and when we get comfortable, we stop doing what? We stop growing. And I got something to share with you today, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not growing, you're dying. Because there's no such thing as standing still when the world's moving forward. So now, let's take a look at this. How many of you have met some people who just love to play it safe? They never want to take a risk. They just want to play it safe. They, don't want, they, they always want to settle for less, and they are the biggest procrastinators that you have ever met in your life. They're always getting ready to get ready to eventually one day get started doing something. Anybody ever met that person where you show up at the reunion 10 years later, and they're still talking about that same idea that they had 10 years ago at the first reunion that they still hadn't quite gotten off the ground yet? Many of us know people like that. But here's what I want to share with you. Let's talk about the 2% of the population that thinks outside of that 98 percentile. What do they do that's different? They go for their what? They go for their dreams. Are they confident? Absolutely. These are people that sometimes are confident for no reason. They could have a terrible, terrible idea, but they're confident in it. But guess what? That's step one, and that's where it starts. What else? They love living without what? Limits. How many of you have ever met a person that's made a decision where no matter what, they're going to be in a position where nobody can limit their income? Anybody ever met someone like that where they refuse to just have a salary? They refuse to have someone else tell them what they're worth. And these are those people that are those two percenters. Let me ask you another question. Do you think that they embrace the unknown? Because, see, here's the thing that I want you all to get. Most people have a lot of fear, but the challenging thing is when you don't know what's on the other side, a lot of people let the fear of the unknown stop them. They have a great business idea. They have things that they want to do, but they're afraid, what if it doesn't work out? They've never done it before. Let me ask you a question. What if Thomas Edison felt that way? We wouldn't have, we'd be sitting here in candles with candles. What if the Wright brothers thought this way? I would have had to drive here instead of fly. Because here's what I want you to do. All the big ideas start with the unknown. But somebody just had a dream. Does that make sense? Now, here's the question. Why? This is the ultimate question. Why should you change your mindset? Well, here's what I want to share with you. I want to tell you a story. And this story changed my life. Anybody ever heard of the Pike Syndrome? I'm hoping nobody raises their hands because I love to be the first one to share this story with you. Has anybody ever heard of the Pike Syndrome? 
Good, good. One person, no. Oh, good. Okay, so here, there's a, an experiment that was done years ago by Canadian scientists. So they did this experiment where they put these pikefish inside of this aquarium. And what they did was they put the minnow on the other side of an invisible glass divider. So here's what happened. What happened is the minnow, um, the, the pikefish would keep banging their nose up against the glass barrier because they could see the minnows, but they couldn't get to them. So they kept banging their noses, banging their noses, just trying to get through and trying to get to those minnows. But all of a sudden, after they kept doing it, they gave up. And they laid right in that area and stayed right in that barrier. And here's what happened. The scientists then removed the invisible barrier. And when they removed the invisible barrier, all of these little minnow started swimming all around the aquarium. Now here's the question. What did the pikefish do? Did the pikefish go after the minnow? The minnow were bumping up against them, coming right in front of them. All the pikefish had to do was open their mouth. But guess what the pikefish did? Nothing. And it eventually starved to death and died. Now this is a true experiment. And it sounds insane. Does it sound insane? But let me ask you a question. How many of us know people like that? Because all that happened was the circumstances changed, but the person's attitude had gone so far back, the pike fish, they didn't have any belief anymore. And many of us are like that with opportunities. Many of you today have opportunities that are coming your way every single day that could increase your revenue tenfold. But because something has happened in the past, 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, you don't even see the opportunity anymore because you're focused on all the things that happened that didn't go right. And many people live their life this way. We become the pike fish in our own world. And we have the pike fish syndrome, and we don't even know that we have it. So I want you to think about this. I want you to think about all the things in your life right now that are coming towards you, that you're putting up this barrier, that you're putting up this wall because of things that have, that have happened to you in your past, that if you just forgot about all the things and understood that those things were learning experience and opened up your mind, that we could get out of being in the pikefish syndrome. Does that make sense to you? And I love that story because when they put that barrier in there, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this and I, I encourage you all Google that so you can actually see the actual, it's, it's kind of sad actually you know, when I really think about it. But it's good for you to see so you can actually see it happen. And when I saw that pikefish just laying there, I said, my heart just dropped. Because I, I said to myself, I know so many human beings that are in this same situation. So now, why are your beliefs important? Because the pikefish didn't believe, even though the minnows were bumping into him, that it was possible for him to eat one. And that's how many of us are because now what happens is our belief become our what? Our thoughts. And then our thoughts become our words. Our words eventually become our what? Actions. And our actions become our habits. Our habits become our values. And then our values become our destiny. But what did it all start with? It all started with our beliefs. So what we have to do is if we want to succeed on that next level, we have to then be willing to change our beliefs. If you want to be successful in no matter what it is that you do, if you don't believe in what you're doing, no one else is going to believe in what you're doing. And it doesn't matter if what you're doing is insane. As long as you believe in it, you can succeed at it. Now, you can't solve the same problem with the same mindset that created it. Here's the question. If you have a problem that's been created by your thoughts and your beliefs, in order for you to now create and change the problem, you've got to now change your what first? Your mindset. You've got to grow as a person. See, here's how life is. Imagine this. Anybody ever seen uh, shades that may have a different tint? One may have like a purple tint, a blue tint, uh, a brown tint. Well, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that this whole front row right here, that we gave them a pair of shades, and the shades were tinted blue. 
So now let me ask you a question. Everything that they see, if they're in here or whether they're outside, what are they going to see? Everything's going to look what? Blue. But if I give this row right here a different pair of shades and your shades are tinted red, what are you going to see? Everything you see is going to be what? Red. So why am I sharing that with you? Let me go. Let me share with you why. Because it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter the situation. You're now going to see it through the blue lenses. You're going to see it through the red lenses. So the reason I'm sharing that with you is because here's what happens. It's not the circumstances that happens to us. It's how we view them. Because everybody in business goes through ups and downs, yes or no? Yes. Everybody in business has people that tell them no all the time, yes or no? Everybody in business has people that says, you know what, I'm on my way to the appointment. I'm, I got my shoes on. I'm in the car. I'll be there at noon, and they never show up. And then you have that one person that continues to go and the other person who quits. What's the difference? It's the same thing. Same exact thing happened. But they had a different mindset. Are you guys getting this? And so here's what I want you to see is why the rich get richer. It all starts with what? Their beliefs. And their beliefs now lead to their potential, their potential lead to their actions, and their actions become their results over a period of time. A human mind with the ability to think big is like a diamond mine that never runs out. It's priceless. So you know, one of my mentors taught me a long time ago, if you're gonna think anyway, because we got to think, right? So if we're going to think anyway, we might as well think what? Big. If we're going to dream anyway, we might as well what? Dream big. Think of the ridiculous things. Think of the things that have never been done. Don't aim for what you think might be possible. Go for what you want. And that's the challenge. Most people I found want to do what's realistic. Successful people we are some of the most unrealistic people you'll ever meet. And the only difference is sometimes we actually achieve those crazy things. So now, here's the challenge with a lot of people, is we're listening to the wrong people. How many of us have ever been to a, a business presentation or been, taught, uh, been, been brought a great business idea and you were all excited, but you went home or you told your friend about this exciting business that you are so interested in, and they shot it down. Anybody ever experienced that? Raise your hands high. Oh my goodness, okay, now we're getting going here. Now, same thing happened with me. And here's what I learned many years ago. You've gotta be careful who you listen to. I want you guys, if you don't get anything today out of this, I want you to understand a person who earns $30,000 a year can't teach you how to make 31, otherwise they'd be doing it. A person who has never built a successful business, I don't care how many ideas they have. Have you ever known that, at, notice at the family reunion, that it's always the least successful person that has the most I comments on stuff. Anybody ever have that brother-in-law or that cousin where every time you go and you're talking about business, they've never even had a business, but they have all of these reasons and all of these ideas of why it won't work. Well, here's what you have to understand. You've got to stop listening to people who are not where you want to be, because if you buy someone's opinion, you've just bought their lifestyle. So if you're not willing to swap lives with them, don't listen to their advice. Now, I know that's harsh because sometimes those people can be people that we really love and people that we really respect, yes or yes. But I tell people all the time, I love my parents, but my parents were educators. How much, if I wanted to become a millionaire, do you think that I was going to get advice from my parents? No because they've never done it. Now, I love them, and they will benefit from everything that I do, but if I want to be a great teacher, guess who I'm going to go learn from? My parents. But if I want to become wealthy, guess what I've got to do? I've got to find someone who's been there and done that and learn what they've done, and then my chances will be much greater. Does that make sense to you? So now, I always tell people, start before you're ready. Start before you're ready. 
So many people have these great business ideas, but they never get started. Why? Because they want everything to be perfect. I tell people all the time, stop waiting for things to be perfect and start today. And a year from now, trust me when I tell you, if you haven't started on that business, if you haven't mashed the gas, you're going to be regretting it a year from now. So start today and figure it out along the way. Trust me, that's how we all did it. Most people don't have a clue. We have a little bit of an inkling of what we want to do, but experience in business is some of the greatest teachers. Three steps to wealth. Number one, what kind of customers do you want? You want loyal customers. You want to be able to build a huge network. And how many of us would love to create passive income? Passive income is doing something one time and getting paid long after the work is done. Those are the kind of businesses that I love to coach and help people build. And I tell people, since you have to think anyway, you might as well think big. Now, let's take a look at most businesses. Because I want to be... I want to give you a real life perspective as well. Now, here's what happens. When you launch your business in the first what? One to two years. How many of you are in the first couple years of, of a business? Anybody in the beginning phase? You feel like this where you're kind of pushing a car uphill? Where every single day you just feel like you got all of this weight on you. You got all this stuff. And if you make one move, everything's going to come tumbling down on you. That's the first two years of business. And guess what? It comes with the territory. You're not by yourself. That's how it is. And it's okay. Here's the difference is you just got to get up every single morning and you got to keep pushing the car. You got to keep pushing the car because guess what happens? By year two to four, you're kind of getting at the top of that hill, right? Because now you got a little less effort, but you still, still can't let your foot off the gas. You know, entrepreneurs, the interesting thing about entrepreneurs, what's the uh, average work day? Eight hour days? Eight-hour days, somebody laughs at, yeah, I wish. Okay, but let me tell you something about an entrepreneur. We're the only people that will work 12 hours a day to avoid working eight. <laughs> it's about freedom for us. So now by year two to four, what starts to happen is you start to kind of get close, but then what starts to happen years five through 10, and that's if every single day, you're using those 24 hours and you're doing what you need to do and you're pushing the gas and you're going through the nose and you're growing and you're reading the books and you're doing all of these things, then what starts to happen is your business can start to take on a life of its own. Does that make sense to you? But we always have to face our what? Fears. Here's the difference that I have found in business. I remember when I wanted to be fearless. I wanted to read enough books so I had no fear. Anybody ever wanted to do that? Where you I, And I honestly believe this. I thought that if I read enough books and learned enough that one day I would have no fear. And I used to have this big fear of guess what? You're not going to believe this. Guess what my, one of my biggest fears was? Public speaking. I had the biggest fear ever of getting in front of an audience and speaking. So I used to read all these books, and I thought to myself, one day I'm going to become fearless. But one day I was reading a book by a gentleman by the name of John Maxwell. And it made an interesting statement, and it made me look at things very differently. It said that successful people all have fear. The only difference is the successful people feel the fear, and they just do it anyway. And I never thought of that. All of these years, I was waiting to become fearless. You know, I thought one day I was going to have a cape and, a, you know, all this kind of stuff and be able to do all kind of things. But I realized that that's not what it's about. And that's what I want you to get. If you have fear of whatever it may be, whether it's speaking, whether it's selling, whether it's training, whether it's writing a book, how many of you have ever wanted to write a book, but you just have a fear of maybe nobody wants to hear your story? Well, guess what? Feel the fear and do it anyway. Because many authors that are out there, many people that are out there, they have done these successful things in the state of fear. They just push through it. And I always tell people, you never look back unless you're planning to go there. And many of us are driving around life looking in the rearview mirror. And you're wondering why you keep ending up in the same place. And I'll tell you what starts to happen is 
We have all this past failure that stops us from our future success. Now, let me ask you all a question. Tell me some things that may have happened in your past that you may still be holding on to that may be stopping you from your greatness. Anybody ever had someone look at you and tell you, ah, you're never going to succeed in that business. Anybody ever had somebody tell you that? What are some other things that people have told you or said to you or things that may have happened that may be holding you back? Someone saying you, you're never going to amount to anything. Those are tough words, especially when you're young. What are some other things? Rejection. Rejection. That's a tough one. Because every single day when you're getting up and people are saying no, sometimes you start to ask yourself, well, maybe this, maybe this isn't the best product. Maybe I do need to rethink this thing because nobody seems to get it. What else? You're not good enough. What else? You can't do that. You're not smart enough. Women can't do that. Absolutely. I got that one. Yeah. Oh, wow. How, well, you got that golden spoon in your mouth, so people don't realize you're working hard. See, people think that even if something's passed on to you, even if it's passed on to you, you got to work for it. What else? It's impossible. Now, here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that all of those things that we talked about, the rejection, I want you to imagine that being a heavy bag that you're carrying around, the person who told you you're never going to amount to anything, the other person who told you you can't do it, the person who said no, the person who said about the silver and the golden spoon. And here's what starts to happen. You've got all these bags, all this luggage that you're walking around with, and you show up in your new business, weight it down by all of this stuff in your past. And you're in a great position. You're in a great business, but you know why you can't go forward? Because you're weighted down with all the stuff that you've got to let go, and you've got to let it go today. And you've got to realize that all that stuff that's happened in the past, guess where you've got to leave it? In order for you to go forward, you've got to leave it in the past. Does that make sense to you? Otherwise, you're like a bird that's trying to fly with weights on your wings. And guess what? You're going to crash every time. It doesn't matter what business. It doesn't matter what opportunity. If you have that weight on your wings, you're going to crash every time, even if you're in the greatest environment ever. Everybody got that? So you've got to understand that when you have your own business, especially if you're in sales, we are in the rejection business. It's a part of it. But I'm going to give you a tip today that's going to change your life. Is that okay? Because here's what we do. And this is what I found about this little bitty word, tiny word. It's just two letters. But it has such a great impact on people. And what is that word? No. N-O. That little bitty word with the great impact. Now, here's what we do. Instead of us focusing, for those of you that are out there doing sales, a lot of times we want to do sales and we make our phone calls and we're always focused on the goal. The goal is to close five today. The goal is to close 10 this week. Anybody ever had those goals type conversations? Raise your hands if you have. Okay, so I'm going to put a twist on it. Are you ready for this? I'm going to give you a million dollar tip and I'm telling you if you apply this, you're going to see your business is sore. Instead of focusing on getting the 10 yeses and getting the five yeses, here's what I want you to do with your sales team. I want you to tell them we're going to have a little game. And this week, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the nose. Now, they're going to look at you like you have three heads because nobody's ever done this with them. And you're going to say, listen, every single day, here's what you have to do. You're going to go through and you're going to get 10 no's every single day. Now here's what happens. What starts to happen is they wake up every single day and they're on their sixth no, they're on their seventh no, but in those no's they've gotten one or two yeses, but they're not focused on the yeses. Now these are people who've never gotten yeses before in their life. But now they're focused on getting the 10 no's, but guess what starts to happen over time? It's not the fact that they're just getting no's, it's now how they start to look at what? They start to look at the no differently. 
They don't look at it as failure. Guess what they look at it as? A part of getting to yes. And that's exactly what it is. In order to succeed in anything that you do, you've got to realize you've got to go through enough no's in order to get to the yeses. And if you can program yourself, if you can program your team and have them look at the no's differently and going through the no's differently, then you'll start to see massive success and massive momentum. Let me tell you something. We did this with the sales team years ago. We took that sales team that had no growth. They were flatlined. It was like we had to do, what is it called where you have to put the... Uh, CPR, absolutely. We, it was like we were trying to raise the dead. But let me tell you what happened. We gave them birth when we did this focus on the nose. People start having fun. People start laughing at the nose. The nose didn't become like a stake in their heart. It just became a mark on their paper. And when you do that and you can shift the mindset of your team and you can shift the mindset of yourself, that's when you start seeing growth. See, you can't fear sales. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. There's so many people that say, I don't like sales, or I'm not a salesperson. Let me ask you a question. Where is the most money being made when you sell something or when you buy something? When you sell something, yes or yes. But yet we're more, more comfortable being buyers than sellers. So I always tell people, don't fear sales, because wealthy people know that no money is made until somebody does what? until somebody sells something. See, sales can't be looked at as a dirty word. I love sales, why? Because I know that what I do helps people. Does that make sense to you? And this is one of the biggest things that stops most people from succeeding. And this is not a little word, this is one of those big words that leads to big problems over a long period of time. And what is that called? Procrastination. Anybody ever procrastinated? We all have. It's okay. It's okay. Anybody procrastinated in the past week about something? It's okay. <laughs> we all have. It's okay. And why do I share that with you? Here, here's what I want you to get. I live in this thing called do it now. And I'm going to teach you something. This changed my life. This is one of the things that helped me cross over to building a seven-figure business. And it's called eating the toad. Now, doesn't that sound disgusting? It's like the last thing in the world you ever want to eat is a what? Toad, right? So now, here's the thing. First thing in the morning, what does eat a toad mean? It means because I would venture to say that a toad is the last thing you'd ever want to eat, that the first thing you do in the morning are the last things you'd ever want to do. Let me give you an example. You wake up in the morning. Guess what most of us do? We do the things that are easy and fun. We make the phone calls that are least effective. We, call, we go on Facebook and we follow up and we look at all the fun stuff, but we don't do the things that lead to our bottom line and build our businesses. We don't make the phone call to that one person that we are so afraid to talk to, but they're the one person that we knew if we could bag that elephant that it could turn our business around. Am I right? So here's what I want you to do. Every morning when you wake up, I want you to eat a what? I want you to eat your toad. That means your first thing you do is the thing you want to do least. So the person that you fear the most to call, that, that, that follow-up that you know you need to make, that phone call that you've been regretting and you are like the phone weighs a thousand pounds, but you have to pick it up anyway. Those are the things that I want you to do. And they have to be the things that lead you to your next promotion. They have to be the things that lead you to your check and your business growing. Does that make sense to you? And guess what happens? It releases stress. Because as a salesperson, let me tell you something. I would walk around all day stressed because I knew there was a phone call that I needed to make. And I knew come 5 o'clock, that my business partner was gonna call me and he was gonna ask me, did you make the phone call? So I go through the whole day and it'd be like 4.58 and I'd be thinking I hadn't made the phone call. I gotta make the phone call. But when I start eating the toad first thing in the morning, guess what, before I had my first cup of coffee, I was feeling good because I'd done all the stuff that I didn't wanna do so I could enjoy the rest of the day. I'm telling you guys, you gotta try this, it's gonna change your life. So in the morning, can we agree that every morning you're gonna get up and you're gonna do what? You're gonna eat your toad. 
Successful people plunge directly into their major tasks in the morning. So I want you to ask yourself right now, what is your toad? What is the one thing that you despise doing every day to build your business? Somebody think about that. What's the one thing? I'm asking you, really. What is the one thing that you absolutely despise doing? What is it? Cold calling. Cold calling. Yeah. Oh, that's a tough one. Absolutely. What else? Prospecting and cold calling. Now, see, here's what I want you to share with you guys about prospecting, cold calling, and networking. Those are two things. Because I look at prospecting and, and networking kind of as the same thing. I love them. And you know why I love them? Because my lenses are a different color than yours are. I used to hate them. I used to hate them. I used to despise calling people I did not know because they were so rude and they were just so just belligerent and they just, and what I learned was I learned to smile and I learned to say with the rude people, when I would hang up, instead of me being upset that they didn't hear me, I would be like, it is so sad, I'm so happy I'm not them. And it would just give me joy, it really would. When it comes to networking, let me tell you a key to networking. One of the things with networking is when you go out, if you have a different attitude and your attitude becomes to give versus trying to figure out, because what I used to do is I used to go out with my business card, it's like spray and pray. Like I just give out business card, pray and somebody would call me. But then one day I said to myself, let me see how I can really connect with people. And now, what can I do for you? So I would exchange business cards, and now I was, it was a reciprocal thing. So if you have a water business, I would be thinking, well, who do I know that needs water? So I would call you back, give you clients, and all of a sudden, guess what? You love me. Why? Because you just met this stranger. I'm calling you. I'm giving you what you want, which is a client. And now guess what you want to do? You want to help me in return. So when you go out with that attitude a lot of times versus just hoping that you're able to get somebody to get in your deal or close a deal with them, then what starts to happen is you start to see your business organically grow. Does that make sense to you? Now, here's the thing. You got to make a habit. Every morning to do that task first, there's something called 10 before 10. I want you to write that down. It's called 10 before 10. Here's what I do. At night, before I go to bed, I write the 10 things that I need to do before 10 a.m. Because many times, if you're an entrepreneur, you may set your own schedule. And sometimes that's a great thing, and for some people, it's a terrible thing. Because we end up doing stuff like sleeping in late. You know, the day gets by, the kids are getting off the bus, and you still hadn't gotten out your robe. You know, yeah, been there, done that. So what you have to do is you have to hold yourself accountable because you're the boss. And see, a lot of times you give yourself a break when you're like the only one who can fire you. You, you know, you let yourself, you know, yeah, because you know somebody else would have fired you a long time ago. But here's what you have to do. You got to do your 10 before 10. What are the 10 most important things to build your business that you need to do tomorrow? So before you put your head on the pillow tonight, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a list. You can either do it digitally or for some of us who like to write in notebooks, that's fine. Write down 10 things that you need to do before 10 a.m. And I don't mean like take out the laundry, pick up the dry cleaners. No, that's not going to grow your business. I'm talking about things that are going to grow your business, get you to another pin level if you're in a business where you, you, you want to get a promotion or something like that. So you write down those 10 things that you need to do before 10 a.m. And I'm telling you, if you do that every single day, you will start to see your businesses grow and you'll start to see your, your days be much better and much more productive. Does that make sense to you? And here's the couple of things too. Everything that you want is where? It's on the other side of fear. And if it's the one thing that I can get to you, the reason why most of us, there are certain things that we may not enjoy doing is because it's a lot of times we fear the response. I didn't like networking because it was a fear of how's this person going to respond to me? You know, are they going to like me? Are they going to think I'm just trying to sell them something? Uh, and I hated that feeling. I absolutely hated that feeling. But it was always the fear because I was always thinking, what are they thinking? Anybody ever been that person? That's why I didn't like public speaking because I get up here and I'd be thinking, what are they thinking? What are they thinking? Do they, are, do they, are they getting what I'm saying? But when you get to the point where it's not about what they're thinking, it's about how you're feeling and what you're giving, that's when life becomes different for you. Does that make sense to you? So now, here's a couple things to overcome fear. You've got to get rid of what? Doubt. 
Doubt is one of the biggest killers there is. And what I mean by that, it doesn't have to be a lot of doubt. It doesn't have to be a wheelbarrow of doubt. It can just be, it doesn't even have to be like a teaspoon of doubt. It can just be like a little grain, just like this much. Just a little bit of doubt. If you have this much doubt, do you realize that it can kill and destroy the biggest businesses in the world? And if you have a business and you have a dream, you've got to get rid of that doubt. How do you get rid of that doubt? You've got to be 100% committed. And when I say committed, you've got to be committed before the results. Most of us want to see the success happen and then we want to commit. No, you've got to be committed before anything happens. When everybody's telling you no, you still got to be committed. When people are telling you, I don't know about that, you still have to be committed. Because it's not about what they think, it's about what you know in your heart. Does that make sense to you? The next thing is you've got to surround yourself with the right people. Some of you right now are hanging around dull, disillusioned, dadgum crybabies. And they're sucking you dry. And some of you live with them. And here's what I want to share with you. You're a sum total of the five people that you spend the most time around. Now, I'm not telling you to walk away from your friends or your family, for that matter. <laughs> but what I am telling you is the circle that you have, you need a new one. This changed my life. When I started realizing, I went to an event years ago. They said, if you're the smartest and you're the most motivated person in your circle, it's time for a new circle. Have you ever found yourself in your circle and you're, you're out and about with your friends and your whole time is spent convincing them of why they should want to do more in life and why it's okay that you go to leadership events. And, 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 and if you're in that circle, I'm telling you right now, you may not realize it, but it's like weeds in a the garden. They start out real small. and You don't even know they're there. And then one day, all of a sudden, they take over. And every negative seed that's planted in your mind by your friends and by your peers it's like a little weed in your garden. And what you have to do is you have to mind your own garden. If you had a real garden, would you just let the weeds grow? Or would you put down the stuff to stop the weeds? So what you have to do is the same thing with your environment. You have control over that. So now if you know that the people that, you're, that are in your life are bringing you down, you've got to now find a new circle of people that are going to bring you up. I'm not saying walk away from your old circle, but what I am saying is find you a new one in addition to the one that you have. Because people with the same destination are the people that you're going to have the most things in common with. So if you're an entrepreneur, guess what? Find you some entrepreneur friends. If you're in sales, find you some sales friends, not the ones that are sick of it and the ones that are terrible at it and the ones that don't like it. No, I'm talking about the ones that are where you want to be. Does that make sense to you? Stay plugged in and act daily on the things that make you the most what? Money. Don't be afraid to talk about money. I don't get how we've gotten to a society where sometimes we're afraid to talk about money. I like talking about money, and it's okay. Why? Because people say, well, money isn't everything. Okay, I get that, but it's sure right up there with oxygen. We need it to survive, okay? <laughs> All right, is that okay? <laughs> So my point for saying that is don't be afraid to do the things that make you money because if you're in business, I tell people all the time, you're either in a business or you have a hobby. And if you want to tell me about how great your business makes you feel, well, that's good, but it's not a business, it's a hobby. If you're in a business, you should be in that business to be able to get you to where you want to be financially. And let me tell you, there's nothing like the freedom and being able to give back when you're at the point where you've been able to achieve some financial success. And then you can teach people that. Now let's talk about leadership. Are leaders normal? No? You don't think so? What makes leaders different? Why are they not normal? They take charge. What else? They step up. They're not followers. Absolutely, they're not followers. What else? They think differently. Absolutely. What else? Say that again for me. They're not complacent. They're not complacent. Absolutely. What else? Visionaries. They're visionaries. Who said that? 
Very good. They're visionaries. Absolutely. See, a visionary is someone who can take you somewhere and you're already there before it's even happened. Who are some of the world's greatest business visionaries? Let's name them. I was thinking the same thing. Steve Jobs. Let me tell you how powerful this guy. He's just amazing. He was just amazing because he could, you could pay $500 for a phone and he already has you excited and ready to get in line for another one that hasn't even been created yet and you don't even know what the functions are, but you just know you've got to have it. That's called vision. Am I making sense to you? When he's able to take us places all these years of, remember when a computer used to be this big and then it had this big loud thing and then it would make this little sound. When, am I showing my age right now? Does anybody else remember that other than me and it make that loud noise in order for it to connect? Well, who would have thought that we could have all of that in the palm of our hand? How amazing is that? And that's what you call true vision. See, leadership is simply one person, the leader, helping another person, the follower, win. So I want you to write that down. If you have people right now that you're leading, how many of us are leaders? How many of us are leaders? How many of you have people that are following you? See, that's how you know you're a leader. See, sometimes we have those self-proclaimed leaders. I'll say, how many of us are leaders that raise their hand? I'll say, how many people follow you that put their hand down? I'll say, well, you're not quite leading yet, but very good in your mind. I like that. But here's the thing. Your goal is to help other people go someplace they've never been before. I tell people all the time, I'm one of the toughest coaches that you'll ever have in business. And when I coach you for 12 weeks, you're going to hate me. Oh, trust me, you're not going to like me because I'm gonna stretch you, I'm gonna push you, I'm gonna get you outside of your comfort zone. But after that's over, you're gonna love me and you're gonna talk about me for the rest of your life because I know that I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take you to places that you've never been. And that's the same attitude that every person in this room, if you're a leader, this is how your people have to feel about you. What are you teaching them? What are you forcing them to do? Are you, are you pushing them? Are you taking them outside of their comfort zone? Are you teaching them how to face their fears? Are you letting them know it's okay when they make mistakes? Not yelling at them when they do make mistakes. See, when my children come home, I've seen parents say, how was your day today? Tell me all the great stuff that happened. And you know, how was little so-and-so? And did you and little so-and-so play? No, when my kids get home, tell me the mistakes you made. I wanna know all the mistakes you made. And guess what? If you made no mistakes today, it wasn't a good day because that means you have not grown at all. You haven't learned anything at all. Because when you're in the learning process, you're going to make mistakes. So I encourage you, if you have a sales team, if you have people that are following you, encourage them and let them know it is okay to make mistakes. You take a look at Thomas Edison. How many times did it take him to create the light bulb? How many tries was it? It was a lot. I like this guy. He's like, I don't know, but it was a lot. But it was thousands and thousands and thousands of attempts. But when you really look at it, it was thousands and thousands and thousands of mistakes. But do we have light today? What if he quit on the 800th mistake? Let me ask you a question. Are you quitting on the 800th no? I have people who quit businesses, they'll get five people that tell them no, and all of a sudden they're sad and quitting. I'm like, thank God that you weren't the one trying to make the light bulb. We'd all be in the dark. You take a look at KFC. He had this recipe, this chicken recipe for many years. He took it from place to place to place. Everybody told him no. Everybody turned him down. 1,200 something people, I can't remember the exact amount, but I know it was up in the thousands that someone finally said yes to his recipe. And that's why we have KFC today. But my question becomes, how many no's have you gone through before you get discouraged and turn around or jump somewhere else or try something different because you feel that what you're doing is not working instead of continuing to go through your no's to get to your yeses. See, here's the thing in life, we don't need more people with titles and pins. What we need are more leaders. See, the boss is always in the back telling everybody what they should do. They're the ones that are called the meeting and they want to give everybody the, okay, here's your action plan, go do it, go do it. See, leadership is different. See, leadership, they're the ones that are out there and they're doing it with you. 
They're the ones that when you say you got five no's, the leader says, gosh, I got seven. Let's talk about it. We're in the same boat. Why? Because they're doing the same thing with you. Does that make sense to you? So you can have everything you want in life. I learned this from Zig Ziglar. If you just help enough people get what they want in life. Isn't that a beautiful thing? If you help enough people get what they want in life, you'll eventually get what you want. And you need your people more than they need you. See, a boss is the kind of person that feels their people need them. A leader understands that you need your people more than your people need you. And you start to act and treat them accordingly. Does that make sense to you? Here's what I want to share with you. Everybody read this with me. This is very important. Because we talk about great leadership, we talk about good leadership. Now I want to talk to you about poor leadership. Because a lot of times we don't continue to grow as leaders because we don't understand the importance of it. But here's what I want to, to get. The high cost of what? Poor leadership. People will leave a business that they absolutely love because of a leader that they hate. Anybody ever experienced that one? Now, here's what I want to share with you. What does this mean for every person in the room? You've got to, every single day that you get up, what are you feeding yourself? Are you growing? How are you handling your clientele? How do your people feel about you? And don't be afraid to ask those questions. Don't surround yourself with yes people. See, many years ago, I used to have a circle of people that were around me where it was like, yes, everything you did was great. Yes, yes, yes. And I realized that I wasn't growing. You've got to surround yourself with people that are going to give you the hardcore truth. And if you were rude to someone, you need that someone around you who's going to pull you on that. If you didn't handle that a situation and, and take it to that next level, you need someone who's going to point that out to you. So I always encourage you. We talked about having that circle of friends, that peer group. You also need in your peer group the people who aren't afraid to tell you when you did something wrong. Why? Because that's the only way you're going to grow. And here's what I want you to get. The more successful that you become, the more difficult it is to find that core group. But you've got to find that core group because that is important to your growth. Does that make sense? So if you have to do like many of us have had to do, I travel the world and I go to events and mastermind events where it's a small group of us. It may be about 10 or 15 of us, but we're all successful. We've all created big businesses. And these are some names that many of you have seen on TV or heard about. But guess what? They all get leadership training too. Why? Because one thing about the best people in the world they all know one thing, is they're never too great to have a great coach. And the moment you start to feel like you've got it figured out, the moment that you start to feel that you don't need to grow, is the moment that your life and your business starts to suffer. So always understand that you need a great coach. Everybody got that? Speaking of great people and great coaches, anybody know who this guy is? Does anybody know who this guy is? Now, here's the only thing. It says there was only one man that could stop Michael Jordan. There you go. <laughs> and who is that one man? Michael Jordan. He's the only person who could ever stop Mike. Why was Mike the greatest? Well, there were many, many reasons. But here's the one thing I want you to get. Number one, he had a superior work ethic. This is a guy who never got caught up in the glitz and the glamour. This was the guy who, after the game, would go back to the court and start practicing. This was the guy who beat the sun up every morning because he wanted to practice. This was a guy who would play in a ball game if he had the flu or if he was sick. How many of us remember that basketball game where he played and he had the flu and it was amazing? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of us wake up in the morning and just have the sniffles and go back to bed because we just don't feel good? See, that's what I'm saying. If you want to be great, you want to be the one that stands out in whatever your profession is, you've got to have and take the same actions that people who are great take. He always says, I never looked at the consequences of missing a big shot. When it was game time, when you are out on the court, stay unattached to the what? Stay what? Unattached to the outcome. What does that mean? What does staying unattached to the outcome mean? Don't marry the results. Now, let me, let me bring that home for you. Because here's what happens to a lot of people. 
when you're recruiting, anybody in a business where you have to recruit people? Anybody in a business where sometimes you talk to people and many of them may not be interested? Anybody ever talked to a number of people and got discouraged because you had a lot of people that weren't interested? Okay, here's what I want to share with you. I'm going to go back. Stay unattached to the outcome. See, here's what I want you to get, and I want you to understand this. If only 2% of people have a 2% mindset, and you're out there looking for two percenters, how many people do you think you're going to have to go through in order to get to the leaders? Stop expecting everybody to get it. And even worse, stop sitting around trying to change someone who doesn't want to be changed. You've got to be tired of it. I see you guys all the time. I see you at the family reunion. I see you at the dinner table sitting and arguing with the same person you've been fussing with for 10 years about why they should love your business. And what you've got to understand is this is how I look at it. I just look at them and say, thank God it's not me. And that's the same attitude that you have to take. So when you're recruiting, if you want to increase your recruiting numbers, you've got to stay unattached to the results. Now, what does that simply mean? Let's just say, somebody give me a number of how many people, if you're a recruiter and you're out there prospecting, what is your goal of people that you're talking to on a daily basis? Well, that's a problem if you don't have a goal. Let's start there. Let's rewind and take it back a little bit, okay? So the first thing you need is a daily goal. How about that? So we need to have a goal of how many people we're going to talk to every single day about whatever our business is. So let me ask you a question. What numbers do you feel would be good numbers to get you the results that you want? 25, then I have 20. Anybody else? Somebody said one. So here's the thing, we've got one, we've got 20, we've got 25. Here's my thing, I don't care what your number is as long as you're consistent with it. So you gotta find a number that you're consistent with. If you can't do 25 every day, don't set that as your goal for every day. You see what I mean? So whatever your goal is, I want you to be consistent with that goal. So let's just say 10. Let me share with you what I used to do. I used to get 10 pennies every single day and paint them red. I'm not really sure why I painted them red. I guess it was to distinguish them because I had a lot of pennies back then, so I wanted to <laughs> make, sure <laughs> make sure these are the ones for prospecting. So I would paint them red, and here's what I would do. I would start out the day with all these pennies in one pocket, one side, and then every time I would prospect someone, I'd take one penny out and put it on the other side. Now here's what I would do. I was not able to go home and get comfortable and complacent until all 10 pennies had gone from this pocket to this pocket. And I held myself accountable, and I did that every single day, day after day, when I didn't feel like it, when I was sick, when it was raining, when it was snowing, when it was cold, when it was hot. It didn't matter. Why? Because that was my goal, and it was my duty and responsibility to follow through. Now, why do I share that with each and every one of you? If you're not holding yourself accountable, that's why you're not getting the results. And what many of us do, we're so attached to the outcome that we stop doing the results that lead to the outcome. So when you have these 10 pennies and you're flipping them from, 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 from pocket to pocket, if number five says no, it doesn't matter because you realize you still got to go and you got to get five more pennies from this pocket to this pocket. So even if number five said, that's crazy, I don't like it, or no, I don't want to try your product, or no, I don't want to try your service, it doesn't matter because you got to go through six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Everybody got that? So you've got to realize that in business, you're going to have four types of people. All the time, you're going to have four types of people. You're going to have your cop-outs. That's number one. Who are your cop-outs? Your cop-outs, they have what? They have no goals and they don't commit. Anybody ever met someone, and it's okay, you can be honest, that they're not commit, like, they're the one that will come out and you'll ask them, what are your goals? And they can't think of it. If you were to pay them $1,000, they still couldn't think of a goal. They just don't have any goals, and they're not committed. They just, they're just not, and you got to realize that you're going to have people like that. And is that okay? Yes, your job is just to be able to identify them. 
It makes your life a lot easier. The next thing is you're going to have your holdouts. What are your holdouts? There are a lot of people here. Holdouts are the people who are afraid to commit because of what? Doubt. These are the people who see a business. They want to get in a business, but they have too much fear, so they never commit. Does that make sense? In addition to that, you're going to have your dropouts. Now, these are the people who set a goal, and they quit as soon as it gets tough. These are the people where, you know, as entrepreneurs, I always talk about the entrepreneur roller coaster. What, what do you guys have here? Is it the, you have Great America, Six Flags? Cedar Point. Okay, so what's the biggest, scariest roller coaster ride at the amusement park? Anybody know the name of it? The Magnum. Is that what it's called? So I bet you, I've never been there, but I would venture to bet you that it's got a lot of loops. It's got a lot of turns, it's got a lot of curves, it's got a lot of ups and a lot of downs, yes or no? Now, here's the thing about that roller coaster. That's called your life as an entrepreneur. And see, whether you like it or not, you're going to ride the entrepreneur roller coaster because it comes with the territory. Let me, anybody want to know how it goes? It goes a little something like this. So you decide to start a business. You get in, you invest your money, and boom, you're strapped in. And now it's go time. So now all of a sudden you start building, you're in year one. Things are going great, you're going up. You know when you're going up, it's going slow in that little click, click, click sound. You know. And you don't know what's ahead, but you're like, wow, this is kind of cool, this is kind of fun. Wow, I like this, I, and it's not really scary. But then all of a sudden you realize and you look down, and you realize how far away you are from the ground. Then all of a sudden you hit the top, and then what happens? the bottom falls out and now all of a sudden you start going on all these loops and all these curves and you're screaming and your stomach has left your body and you're asking yourself, why did I even get on this ride? Anybody ever felt like that? That's called the entrepreneur roller coaster. Let me share with you. That's what happens. You get in business. You start to have some success. Then all of a sudden, you start to lose money. You start to wonder why you invested in that crazy marketing scheme. You start to say to yourself, why did I expand before I was ready? Why didn't I listen to the person? Why did I even? And then all of a sudden, you're riding this roller coaster. Here's the difference. The difference is, are you enjoying the ride? And are you going to get back in line and continue to ride that roller coaster? Or are you going to do like a lot of entrepreneurs and get off and never look back because of your one experience? And that's what your dropouts do. They're the ones that set the goal, and they're so attached to what everybody thinks, what everybody says, the lack of income, the lack of uh, all the stuff that's going on, that they quit before they really get started. And I'm here to share with you that we're all going to ride the roller coaster. But what you've got to make sure is you have to have the right attitude while you're riding the roller coaster and understand that it's just a part of the game. Everybody got that? And then. You're going to have your all outs. Who are your all outs? I like that. She said me. I love that. I love that. Your all outs are the ones that set goals and they commit to them and pay the what? Pay the price to reach them. See, what you have to realize is you've got to pay the price for success up front and in full. There's no layaway. There's no down payments. You've got to pay the full price, and that means going all in. But most people, if you want to succeed, you have got to get to the point where you're a number four. So I want to ask you today, and I want you to be honest. This is an honest moment. Okay, this is our zen honest moment. What number are you right now? Not what number do you desire to be. If you were to look at your actions, and you would look at your daily habits, what number are you today? And the reason why I ask you that is because that's a very important question. And I've been multiple, many of those different numbers at different times in my business. And that just means if you're not the number you want to be, it's okay. And I always tell people that if being who you are would get you what you want, you'd already have it. So that's why you're here today. That's why you're listening today. That's why you're growing. But you've got to get to the point where not only are you an all-out, but if you want to take your life and business to another level, surround yourself with all-outs and find you some all-outs and get them in your business. Get them on your team. If you want to accomplish a big dream, you've got to find an amazing team. 
If your team is terrible, I don't care how big your dream is, it's going to be hard to get to your dream with a bad team. But you can have a, 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 a bad dream and have a whole lot of success if you have a great team. Does that make sense to you? So you've got to make sure you have a great team behind you. Now, here's the question. What is commitment? What is commitment? Sticking with it when it gets tough. Sticking with it when it gets tough. I like that. What else? Commitment. Laser focused without getting sidetracked. Being laser focused without getting sidetracked. Not accepting anything but success. Not accepting anything but success. I like that. Commitment is doing what you said you were going to do. Long after the mood in which you said it is gone. Do I need to say that again? Commitment is doing what you said you were going to do. You said you're going to talk to 10 people a day. You said you're going to talk to 25 people a day. You said you're going to talk to one person a day. It's doing what you said you were going to do. Long after the mood, you wake up, you're tired. You wake up, you have a cold. You wake up, the kids are out of school. The, the, everything's crazy. The mood you set it in is gone, but you still do it anyway. Doing what you said you were going to do long after the mood in which you said it is gone. And guess when the mood's going to be gone? As soon as you walk out of your seminar, as soon as you cut off the tape. Because guess what's going to happen? Life's going to hit you right in your nose. And it's going to ask you how you're going to handle it. But I always say, I believe in failing forward. Because if I fall flat on my face, that just means I'm five feet, four inches closer to my goals and dreams. So if I fall, let me fall hard. Because I'm always going to get up. And that's the attitude that you have to take. Many of us want things to be given to us. But if you want your freedom, and what I say freedom is, is whatever that is to you. Whatever in your mind freedom is, but nobody's going to give it to you. When has freedom ever been given? You have to take it. So if you know that's what you want, you got to get up every single day. How many hours do we have in a day? 24. The person who has 25, please stand. <laughs> and why do I share that with you? Because I want to share, I want to do the level playing field thing here with you really quickly. There are a lot of challenges that we have in life. Some of us have it easier than others. Some of us have more opportunity than others. Some of us are born in different countries than others. But guess what? The one thing, the one thing that we all have the exact same amount of is 24 hours in a day. The multi-billionaire has 24 hours in a day. And the person sleeping in their car has 24 hours in a day. Now, here's the thing. The question becomes, what do you do with your 24 hours? When I was sleeping on the floor of my best friend's one bedroom apartment, before I decided to grow and become a different person, there were certain things that I had to do. Well, I have to watch this TV show. It's only 30 minutes. And then, oh my goodness, I can't. I, I have to watch this and I have to listen to the news and I, I, I have to go by and spend. And I had all these things that in my mind I had to do that weren't leading me anywhere. And those 24 hours a day were being wasted doing nothing, not helping me grow. And when I started to shift, and I started to not only track every hour, I started to track every minute. I started to track every second of every single day. What am I doing right now in this moment? And if it's not something that's helping me grow and get closer to my dreams and goals, I immediately stop and get back on track. And I'm telling you, if you can do that, that is when you're going to start to see the whole game change. Does that make sense to you? See, to the boxer, what commitment is, is getting up one more time. Anybody ever seen a boxer get knocked down? And you can tell when they get up that they have no idea that they're even up, but they're conditioned to get back up. Muhammad Ali, if he ever got knocked down, one thing you knew, he was going to get back up. Why? Because he understands the power of commitment. But then there's some boxers who will get knocked down and throw in the little flag and you know, say, well, let me go back to the gym and practice some more. Those are two different types of people. To the soldier, it's going over the hill, not knowing what's on the other side. Going into the unknown, because there's a purpose greater than all of us. 
to the business owner. It's calling the people that you are most afraid to talk to. And you're looking at the phone like this. That's what commitment is. See, commitment is tested by action. What are you doing when no one is looking? I read a, the most amazing book. It was a little small book. And the book was, the title of the book was, Who Are You When No One Is Looking? Who are you when no one is looking? Now, why do I share that with you? When you come to the meeting and you're in front of your team, you're telling them all the stuff you're going to do, you're making the calls in front of them, but when you're home, there's no one there with you, and you know what you should be doing, who are you and what are your actions? And that is how you're able to gauge who you're going to become. It's based on who you are when no one's looking. And when I read that book, it changed my life. Because a lot of times we show up and we're one person on the stage and a totally different person off the stage. And who I am on the stage is who I am off the stage. I know a lot of people who get on the stage who may not be who they are off the stage. Don't be that person. So if you tell your team what to do and you're leading, lead by example. And you should be proud of who you are and what you're doing when the camera's off and nobody's watching. Does that make sense to you? Muhammad Ali made a statement years ago. It says, the fight is won or lost far away from witnesses behind the lines. It's in the gym and out there on the road long before I dance under those lights. Ali talked about how the one thing he hated was going to the gym. And for many of us that are in sales or many of us that are entrepreneurs, we talked about those things that we hate, the prospecting, the networking, the recruiting, the getting the customers, the all of this stuff. But guess what that is, ladies and gentlemen? That's our gym. That's our workout. And when we go to the conventions and get the awards, that's our boxing match. That's being under the lights for us. Everybody got that? So if you want to know what your future holds, Look at your consistent actions. Did you know that a consistent drop of water can break a stone over time? Ooh, that should, be, that should make you feel real good. Because take a look at this. If a consistent drop, drop of water over time can break a stone, imagine what consistent habits over time just the little things can break down the barrier, can be the breakthrough to take your life and your business into greater heights and to new levels. And that's the thing that I want you to get out of today more so than anything, is being consistent in your positive and productive actions. And the last thing that I really want to talk to you about is why we do what we do. You know, years ago, there was a little boy. And he went to his mom, and his mom was making some ham for Christmas. And she got out the pan, and before she put the ham in the pan, she cut off the end of this side of the ham, and she cut off the end of the other side of the ham. And then she walked over to the oven, and she put the ham in the oven. So her son looked at her and said, Mom? Just a question, why, why do you cut the ends off the ham before you put it in the oven? And she said, because that's what my mom does, and that's how you're supposed to cook a ham. So he said, okay. So then he went to his grandma, his mom's mom, and said, Grandma, why do you cut the ends off the ham before you put it in the oven? She said, because that's what you're supposed to do, and that's what my mom did. So that's how you cook a ham. So then he went to his great-grandmother. And he said, great-grandma, I have a question for you. Why is it that we cut the ends off of the ham before we put it in the oven for Christmas? And she stepped back all feeble and weak and looked at him and said, I always did it because my pan was too small. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do I share that story with us? Many of us today, as entrepreneurs, and as business people, and as leaders, we're just doing stuff because somebody before us did it, and we don't even know why we're doing it. 
And what you have to know is when it's new world, new time, if you don't grow with the time, and if you don't enhance who you are and do the right things for the right reasons, you will be stuck back in the times from before, doing things because they were done. This is why so many of us have not yet grown our businesses at the level in which we know how to grow them because we're still focused on the way our great grandparents or our parents or someone else that we've known from the past grew their businesses. Don't allow anyone's reasons and actions and limitations to dictate your future growth and success. Does everybody get that? And the other thing I want to share with you is I was talking to a gentleman. We were just having a great conversation. This has always been one of my favorite, favorite, favorite sayings. Because in life, we can make a lot of excuses. And trust me, some of our excuses we look at as reasons. Well, you know, I'm just too old. Or I'm too young. Or I don't have enough education. Or, or, or maybe I can't do it because of my gender. We have all of these reasons why. We can't be the greatest there is to be. But what I want to share with you is it is impossible to make excuses and money at the same time. So you've got to make a decision which you choose to make. We're either going to make excuses or you're going to make money. You're either going to make excuses or you're going to have success. You're either going to make excuses or you're going to grow and go to the next level. But guess what you can't do? You can't have both, and you can't do both at the same time. Does everybody get that? So I tell you what, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with all of you. And if I were to leave each and every business person here with any words of advice, I just did a panel um, in Philadelphia. I spoke at an expo, and I was on the Celebrity VIP channel uh, 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 panel with a group of audience, they were able to ask us questions. And one of the questions was, you know, what piece of advice would you give to entrepreneurs today? And the main piece of advice I would give, and it's very simple, and many of you have heard this before, and it's never stop growing. And that's why it's so important that you're in this room right now. When you walk out of this room and everything that you do, never stop growing. Never stop planting those little seeds of growth because it's no different from the bamboo plant. And many of us have heard the story. You may not see the results of the seeds that you're planting right now. You won't see it. So right now, for those of you that are out there prospecting and getting customers and you're talking to a person here, you're talking to a person there, and there's nothing happening. I get it. Nobody's moving. Many people are saying no, but guess what? Keep planting those seeds. Keep planting those seeds. Keep planting those seeds, because what's going to happen is eventually the harvest is going to come, because you never stop planting the seeds. But what I would encourage you to not do, don't get mad and take your seeds and go home. Because when you do that, what starts to happen is everything that you could have been, all of the talents and the big things that we need, that only you have, because what you have is unique to you. And the richest place in this world is in the graveyard. Because most of us take all of our dreams, the majority of our talents, and these wonderful ideas that could have come to fruition to the grave with us. But I want to encourage you today to keep planting your seeds. You know why? Because I can't wait to see the masterpiece that many of you are going to create. I can't wait to see the businesses that are, going, that are going to grow from just the minds in this room. Right now, your city needs some seeds to be planted. The minds in this room, if you put it together and you don't give up on you, and you don't give up on each other, you can turn this whole city around and it can grow based on your actions. And that's what I see for each and every one of you. So continue to plant your seeds and don't ever let anyone stop you from your dreams. And it has been my pleasure and my honor to be here with you this evening.